so today I will try to uh, ref to formulate again and to explain, not to prove. The proof uh, requires some more uh, efforts. The theorem we uh, are talking about, about the relation between the notion of the mixed volume and then uh, or the, between the Newton polyhedra and between the number of solutions, non-zero solutions, of a system of algebraic equations. Let me start with saying what is it about. We have such a system of algebraic equations n algebraic equations of n, say, complex variables, and we are interested in the solutions such that xj is not zero for any j. The solutions which have all components non-zero. Definitely, the very definition of this is related to a specific system of coordinates. So, actually, we are not allowed to change the system of coordinates because the, uh, so the set of solutions is going to change. And we are interested in the number n of pi 1 pi n, the number of solutions with all non-zero coordinates. The number of solutions with all non-zero coordinates. Actually, the problem as it is set here is more or less hopeless because the number of solutions can be whatever. For example, if I choose all p's to be the same, which is a possibility, then there will be infinitely many solutions. Or if I choose uh, two p's to be the same plus one, then there will be no solutions. Correct? Uh, so I need to, to tell exactly what do I mean by the number of solutions. In order to do this, I, <coughs> mm, by the way, this is a, let me call it this, because n will be needed for something else, for Newton. Uh -huh. Okay. To each polynomial, we associate, let me call it simply ni, the Newton polynomial, the uh, Newton mm, polyhedra of this polynomial. We all know what it means. We take the powers that are present in this poly polynomial with non-zero coefficients, put them into the n-dimensional lattice, and then take the convex hull of the points in this n-dimensional lattice. So these are convex compact polyhedra in R, uh, R n with vertices in Z n, even Z plus n. Mm -hmm. A very important point is that the only information we would like to preserve about the polynomials are these Newton polyhedra. So what are we forgetting? We are forgetting the values of the uh, coefficients, except that we know that some values must be zero and some must be non-zero. More precisely, the only information we keep about these polynomials is that the coefficients at the powers which are extreme points of this polyhedra 
un0, that's what we keep. And all powers with uh, outside of this polyhedra, as uh, the coefficients are zeros. That's it. So actually, we preserve a very small amount of information about the polynomials. What's the question? Uh, well, none. As a matter of fact, none. You can easily understand that if you do even uh, very simple linear transformations of coordinates, uh, this is not supposed to preserve the uh, polynomials. But you see, it is quite natural because by its, uh, our problem is about solutions with non-zero coordinates. You do very small changes of coordinates and everything that was zero, non-zero, uh, 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 everything that was non-zero can become zero and vice versa. Zero coordinates can become non-zero coordinates and so on. Mm -hmm. So this is, uh, this is a very coordinate related question. That's why, by the way, this theory is called the theory of few nomels, not polynomials, but few nomels. Because actually what it says that uh, uh, the, uh, the interesting results pop up when the number of uh, non-zero coefficients is relatively small. In this case, you can uh, uh, the geometry of this Newton polyhedra is uh, interesting, and in this case, you can say something. Okay. So <coughs> we are solving this problem not for individual polynomials, I would say, but for huge families of polynomials. So we are uh, solving this problem in uh, generic terms. What does it mean? I forget about everything about these polynomials, except of their Newton polyhedra. And I'm considering, instead of this system, I'm ready to consider any other system with other polynomials, provided that the Newton polyhedra are the same. And I feel myself free to change, the, uh, to change the values of the coefficients as I like, only preserving the uh, system of coordinates, only preserving the polynomials, uh, the polyhedron, polyhedra. In this case, there is a theorem. I'll try to. The first result was due to Havans, uh, not Havansky, I'm sorry, Kushnirenka. A different proof was proposed by uh, David Bernstein. Uh, I think these are all, but actually there's some very important additions were made by Askold Hovansky. But actually the theorem I'm going to talk about was formulated, was proved by Kushnirenk and then another proof was given by Bernstein. But uh, Hovansky made some very important contributions in the whole area. And this is the theorem. For generic polynomials pi i12 n with Newton polyhedra given, the number of solutions, number of solutions is n factorial times the mixed volume of this system of polyhedra. There's a good question why this number is integer. 
I must say that I do not know why, but by the left-hand side of the equation, it should be integer. Again, I have some uh, doubts about that, but this is the correct formulation of the theory. What do you mean by generic? Hmm? What do you mean by generic? Uh, the, uh, I uh, will try to explain. I, uh, this is very important, therefore I will try to explain it very, very uh, precisely. Okay, let me explain it this way. Consider a system of polynomials P1, Pn, such that Newton po polyhedron of Pj is Nj, J1, N. Consider all, uh, any system of polynomials with a prescribed Newton polyhedra. That's it. So what is left to determine these polynomials after I have fixed Newton polyhedra? The values of coefficients. Mm -hmm. Values of coefficients. So <coughs> the values of coefficients are free for me to choose. I want some of the values to be definitely non-zeros, but uh, other than being non-zero, they are free for me to choose. So what kind of freedom do we have in the choice of this polynomial? The freedom is this. Z and J product where Z of and J is the number of integer points in the polyhedron and J. So, in each polyhedron, I am free to choose exactly this number of coefficients. Correct? In each. For uh, if the polyhedron is fixed, then the number of uh, degrees of freedom is exactly this. Is it? Because the coefficients are whatever I want. Since there are this many polyhedra, then this is my number of coefficients. So actually my freedom is c to this power. Complex coefficients can be uh, chosen this, like this. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, now, I say that a set of strings of polynomials is generic. The set, a set of strings of polynomials is generic. if their coefficients do not belong to an algebraic subset of this space. Difficult. So, let me put it this way. Coefficients possible coefficients are points in this huge space, are they? Imagine that this is the huge space. Okay. Choosing different strings of polynomials, I will get different points in this huge space. Definition. A set of strings of polynomials is called generic if the related points related to the set of strings, correct, are not in an algebraic subset of this uh, space. What does it mean, algebraic subset? 
uh, these points do not lie in the uh, <coughs> do not uh, do not belong to a um, okay it's much it can be formulated as this to a uh, hypersurface defined by an algebraic equation in this set so what does it mean the set is non generic non generic means the following i can find an algebraic surface what is an algebraic surface the set of solutions of an algebraic equation and all these points this is this set the no, this is this space the huge space i have a surface in this huge space correct and all the points coming from my chosen strings of polynomials happen to be in this on this uh, hypersurface is it very likely to happen or not it is very unlikely to happen correct if i am free to change the coefficients uh, definitely i want some of them to be non zero but otherwise i am free to change them then definitely i can get out of this surface quite easily correct let me see suppose the space were three dimensional yes uh -huh. how many points would you have you have three points no no oh, that's no 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 the actually the interesting part uh, generic sets are uh, the sets with infinitely many points <laughs> because if you have finitely many points you can always invent in, invent an algebraic surface passing through them mm -hmm. That is what I mean, that I am free to change all coefficients. But this space is the space of coefficients. Yes. It's the, the space of free coefficients, the ones that are not forced to be zero. Yes. Um, and um, a family. A set. A, a set of collections of polynomials, generic. Um, we can define various um, planes or algebraic surfaces, surfaces in this space mm -hmm. and um, what any any algebraic surface will be of dimension n minus one or At k most. minus uh, one in yes. this k-dimensional space yes and um, what's being said is that we can there must, there's infinite numbers of such surfaces mm -hmm. because, b but um, we have a generic set if the coefficients are not restricted to be in any one of those. Yes, surfaces. exactly. Okay. Actually, if the set of coefficients is thick, it has this volume non zero then it is already non-zero volume, but not the uh, volume. Yeah. Huh? Can't I count the coefficients though? I mean, T1 has got two coefficients and T2 has got six coefficients, etc. Okay, very good. So and then add them all up when I get up to Pn, I've got a certain number of coefficients. And so you have, a, say, if you have two and six, then you have an eight-dimensional coefficient space. Yes. Mm -hmm. And in this eight-dimensional coefficient space, you consider a set of polynomials to be generic if that set occupies a volume in the end. Yes, if, for example, it occupies a volume. Or the set of coefficients. The set of coefficients. Of possible values of coefficients. Coefficients must yeah. occupy a volume. Ah. This must be very close to the, what physicists are thinking about, always. When you are getting some polynomials or whatever functions, you are never sure that the value of all coefficients involved are known precisely. They are known to some degree of uh, uncertainty. And therefore, you should not, the answer should not depend upon precise values of coefficients. You must have freedom to change them somewhat. And if you have this freedom to change them somewhat, you will get a generic family. Yes. 
You are starting with uh, finitely many coefficients. It is always non-generic. So you have an infinite number of coefficients in order for this definition of non-generic. I, uh, yeah, I need an infinite number of systems to consider. A generic system consists of infinite number of uh, strings of polynomials, always. But you better look at it this way. You start with any system of polynomials. Definitely the coefficients form of these particular polynomials, they are non-generic. They are very specific. What, I'm still not saying what the infinity is. So n, little n is finite. Yes. The, there's going to be a highest order of terms in the polynomial. Yes, sure. Uh -huh. So what is it that's infinite here? The number of what? No, no. The thing is, you have coefficients of these polynomials. And you say to yourself, I do not object to changing coefficients a little bit in any direction I want. I do not object to that. So you're going to draw a ball around, yes. around each point? Yes. Okay. I do not object to that. And I am considering all systems that appear, because actually in this case you have not one system but infinitely many systems of algebraic equations. And you are looking for generic properties of this system. These generic properties can be violated for at uh, some particular point, but generically they are not violated. So the system of coefficients basically like, fills the space. So the space of co so if you take the it, it at least it has uh, volume in this space. So if it was like n dimension. So if that was like n dimension, like capital n dimensions. Then mm -hmm. that means that. Um, the surf, the height. If they lie, if they lied on a sur hypersurface, the hypersurface would be like n minus one. Dimensions. Yes, sure. But then, couldn't you also consider those points lying on that hypersurface to be generic if you just restrict it to that hypersurface? Uh, no, then the result can be uh, well, actually um, uh, the result can be uh, if you want them to be restricted to a hypersurface, then the result might be different. Mm -hmm. On a hypersurface, the number of solutions can be either much smaller or even much bigger. Let me talk about a different example to connect with things that we all know. Suppose we were looking at a set of linear inhomogeneous oh, equations. Very good. And we have a space of uh -huh. coefficients. Uh -huh. For typical values in that space of coefficients, the determinant is non-zero. There's selected points in that space in which the determinant is equal to zero. In fact, there's some surface in which the determinant is equal to zero. Uh, the generic case is there's a solution because the determinant exactly is one. zero. Uh -huh. And the non-generic case is that there isn't a solution. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, uh, or there's an infinite number of solutions because the uh -huh. equations are nearly dependent. Um, now, what? Um, or maybe that no that solutions at all. Being non-zero, that's one condition. Yes. And I can see that one condition defines a surface in yes. that space. Algebraic condition, by the way. And it's an algebraic condition. Uh -huh. yes. Now you are saying here that not only is there that one condition, but I can think of any of lots of other conditions also. And I but, can think uh, any algebraic condition, and that any algebraic condition will lead, it, lead to have a different number of solutions. Yes. Uh, first of all, you do not need to think about several conditions, because if you impose several conditions, the set of uh, points satisfying several is inside, yes. say, uh, one surface. Yes. So actually, that was exactly the example I wanted to discuss right now. Okay. Consider, consider a system of non uh, consider that all these polynomials are first-order non-homogeneous polynomials. Then what is this? So this is a system of n linear equations with n unknowns. We try to solve it. Under what condition uh, can we be sure that this system has, uh, always has a solution? The condition is that the determinant of the linear part is non-zero. This is an algebraic condition, one algebraic condition. 
So, if the coefficients are such that the determinant is non-zero, this, this is definitely a generic situation, isn't it? Yes? Then, how many solutions do we have? Exactly one. Then we have exactly one solution. Well, uh, the generic is not a polynomial. Generic polynomial is uh, not very good. Uh, the set is called generic if it is uh, if it is generic. Mm -hmm. But what you're talking about now is a set, is a set of systems. Mm -hmm. Yes. Right? So you can have a set of systems of polynomials where I have infinitely many systems of polynomials. And that's where the infinite, infinite And we are looking for generic properties of these systems. That's what we are. Uh, what is the infinite? There's a little end there. So the little no, no, no. The, the, the polynomials. I allow polynomials to vary. What does it mean vary? I allow the coefficients of the polynomials to change a little bit. Then you get a new set of polynomials. You get another one, you get another set of more. I do not pretend that I know the coefficients for sure. So and if something is bad for these particular coefficients, for example, no solutions or infinite many solutions, but everything becomes very good if I slightly change all coefficients, then I want to know what uh, is the number of solutions for slightly changed coefficients. Is, is it fair to just say that this theorem is telling you the number of uh, solutions except for a set of measure zero? On the yes, side? exactly. Exactly. It is much more than the set of measure zero. It is an algebraic set. It is definitely of measure zero, but it is really a very small set. Mm -hmm. In order to stick to this set, you have to impose algebraic conditions, which is a very severe condition. Yes? Is it, um, unless the coefficients obey a particular algebraic condition, or unless the coefficients obey any algebraic mm -hmm. condition? It's any? Any. Actually, the result is, uh, provided that the uh, coefficients do not obey any algebraic condition then but the thing you see the moment you are fixing one system you can always find an algebraic equation that it is satisfied by but then you are not allowing yourself to change the coefficients arbitrarily even small arbitrarily the, it is a very important uh, situation every set of coefficients is non-generic. There is some algebraic condition, uh -huh. but not every family. Well, a family is as long as the family occupies a volume in this big space, uh -huh. then, uh, then it yes. can't satisfy. Yes. Okay. But the important thing is again, I uh, simply appeal to your uh, understanding that you never know coefficients for sure, yeah. and therefore it does not make a lot of sense to concentrate on this specific value unless you allow yourself to change this specific value only a little bit. You know the value of the coefficients but up to some accuracy. Okay? And therefore this is a natural, by the way, this, I think these kind of ideas uh, were first uh, formulated by Poincaré. Generic position. Do not get very much excited about uh, any particular system. Try to understand what happens if you are free to uh, vary the parameters. Again, uh, I suggest that you look at it exactly this way. You definitely start with uh, one system of equations. But then you tell yourself, OK, I'm free to change the coefficients a little bit within the margin of error that is inherent to the problem. OK?
total dimensional ball in filling the... No, no, you actually, what you, you need for this theorem to be true <laughs> is the following. You allow the coefficients, which are not supposed to be zero, only these coefficients. You allow them to change a little bit, only a little bit. No, there is no. That is the, the, the that is the point. There cannot be a hypersurface which will uh, contain all these systems with varied coefficients. Okay, but never. Never. Okay. The clear answer is never. But yes. What is the theorem giving us then? Because it can't. It's not giving us solutions to any specific. Yes. Problem. No. It says how many solutions you are going to have for almost all systems. That is a good okay. formulation. For almost all systems, and this almost is a very strong almost, for almost all systems with the given uh, Newton polyhedra, the number of solutions is this. End of story. Yes? But any time you pick any specific problem... You are not uh, sure that it is uh, gen generic. But again, don't, uh, from some point of view, say, from some perverse mathematical point of view, that means that this is a meaningful theorem. This is a meaningless theorem. Okay, you have a, a, this system and you cannot say anything about this. But just speak, uh, keep in mind that you do not have a specific system. You have a specific system up to small changes. Is there a test of genericity if I give you genericness? No, no, no. There any, any finite set of polynomials is non-generic. Any finite set of polynomials is non-generic. So this theorem does not apply to any finite set of polynomials? No, 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 no. But nevertheless, it is a very deep and good theorem. <laughs> <laughs> because again, when you are dealing with uh, not imaginary mathematical problems, but with real problems, uh, say in physics, you are dealing on not with these specific polynomials, known up to uh, with all, uh, say, Dig digits after the point. You know, say, 75,000 digits after the point, but not more than that. And therefore, you are allowed to move a little bit. And then it becomes a perfectly reasonable and sensible and powerful result. Are there particular types of algebraic uh, surfaces which cause this theorem? Yes, there are, but it is quite difficult to uh, for me now to, uh, uh, it's quite easy to understand uh, why they should be, uh, think about the polynomials of the first degree. So what you should avoid? You should avoid the determinant of the linear part to be zero. Determinant equals zero, it is an algebra one algebraic condition. You must stay outside of that, and that's it. The moment you stay outside of that, you are okay. Definitely, for each system, depending on these uh, polyhedra, there are also very specific algebraic conditions that should be avoided. Okay? But uh, just to... I don't know uh, how to write them down. I don't know. Maybe one can simply follow, but it doesn't even make sense to think about it this way. You simply always remember, and this was, uh, for me, when I first learned this kind of ideas, it was quite long ago, it was a very, it was a radical change in the attitude. In mathematics, you have a system of polynomials, and you are solving this particular system of, system of equations. You see? But when you think about it a bit deeper, you understand that, no, you are solving <laughs> not one system, but a lot of systems. Okay? We got it? It's just one simple question. Mm -hmm. Z was the number of vertices in... The no, Z was the number of integer points, integer points with all coefficients, uh, with all coordinates integer, inside the uh, polyhedron. Oh, okay. These are the coefficients which may pop up. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think I've uh, made a point that you never solve a concrete system. Did I?
And mathematicians who tell you that they do solve concrete systems, they're simply <coughs> cheating you. Well, they may be solving, but <laughs> in practice, you are never solving a concrete system. You are solving a system, a family of systems. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, let us try to understand why this. Uh, I'm not going to give you a precise uh, proof, but I think I will give you uh, the understanding of why this result should be true. This coefficient is correct, because if you consider the situation when all uh, polyhedra are the same, it is a particular case, and all, they ca all of them come from a it's a linear system, so actually in this case I can consider that all polyhedra are in say n-dimensional space are such um, what are the pyramids in the n-dimensional space. Then what you have here you have a system of linear equations, and generically the system of n linear equations has exactly one solution. Okay? And if, since all the uh, Newton polyhedra are the same, then this must be simply the volume of this, uh, the volume of this uh, pyramid. And the volume of this pyramid is 1 over n factorial. 1, 1, 1, and you have to divide by n factorial. Okay? Then this is 1 over n factorial. I multiply by n factorial, I get 1 what I am expected to get. So the coefficient is correct. Mm -hmm. Now, so let me start. Uh, say outline of a proof. I want to get this number. I want to get this number. But actually this number, since the only thing I'm fixing are the Newton polyhedra, correct? So actually this number must be some uh, I'm running out new, depending upon the Newton polyhedra. This number is dependent only upon the Newton polyhedra, no, on nothing else. And I want to understand the properties of this function. So the function takes in n polyhedra and gives you a number. It is obviously symmetric in these coefficients. Because if I permute them, what I'm doing, I'm permuting the polynomials, but it doesn't matter in which order they are in the system. So it is obviously symmetric. Secondly, it is linear, it is polylinear, and this is important. Let me check that it is linear in N1. It is linear in N1, N2, and so on, okay. uh -huh. in each of the, in each of the arguments. Let me check that it is linear in N1. Mm -hmm. Okay. I have such system. P1 is 0, P2 is 0, Pn is 0. I'm considering the number of solutions of this system. Yes? Now imagine that the first polynomial factors into a product of two. P11, P12 is zero. 
Imagine that it factors into two. Then, what are the solutions only of the first equations? Of the first equation. P11 is 0, P12 is 0, or P12 is 0. So, the number of solutions of P11, P12, P2, Pn is number of solutions P11, P2, Pn plus the number of solutions of P12, P2, Pn. Fair enough? If I have a solution, in particular it must be a solution of the first equation and of the rest equations. So if I have a solution, then it must be either one of these solutions or one of these solutions. Yes? Vice versa. If it is one of these solutions, it is a solution of this. If it is one of these solutions, it's a solution of this. What's your question? Couldn't they overlap? Uh, OK, definitely they could overlap. Uh, this is a good question. But I count solutions with multiplicities. A good question. I'm counting solutions with multiplicities. Okay. So if they overlap, they should be counted twice. Mm -hmm. Yes. OK. So this is obvious. Tell me, please, what is the Newton polyhedron of P11, P12? It is the Newton polyhedron of P11 plus the plus is the um, uh, uh, Minkowski sum. Newton polyhedron of P12. Should I explain this? Look, if I multiply two polynomials, what do I do? I uh, add the powers and multiply coefficients at the same powers. Okay. But, an important point. If I have one Newton polyhedron and I have another Newton polyhedron, actually when I take the sum of this, I'm interested only in the extreme points of the sum. Because if I know extreme points, I know the whole uh, in, uh, convex set. But extreme points, as I explained already, are obtained by summing each extreme point here is obtained by summing exactly two, extreme, uh, exactly one extreme point from here and exactly one extreme point here. You remember this? That means that extreme points here are obtained from extreme points here. And the coefficient is not going to be 0 because I multiply two non-zero numbers. So the uh, geometric lemma that I proved, I think, last time is quite useful. So this is a very important thing. So this, from this and this, Linearity in N1 follows. Linearity in N1 follows from two points. This and this. Isn't it nice? I think that was... Uh, that you said if it factors. Okay. Uh, linearity means if I uh, replace n1 by n11 plus n12, then uh, it must uh, uh, decompose into the sum. And what I say is exactly the following. This decomposition comes from factoring. 
if they factor, then you get the Minkowski sum. Mm -hmm. The converse is also true? Yes. Yeah, is the converse important? So it is not important. Just a moment. Uh, let me uh, put it here. Converse also in order to get the result. No, no. Uh, okay. The thing is, again, when I'm dealing with uh, Newton polyhedra because of convexity, I'm interested only in the in extreme points because if I know extreme points, I know the whole polyhedra. Correct? Extreme points of the sum are uh, any extreme point of the sum is the sum of exactly two extreme points is the sum of exactly one extreme point from here and exactly extreme point from here. So on the level of extreme points, I do have this uh, product. But as for others, I can simply impose this product for others. I am considering only extreme points. Uh, consider this polynomial, consider this polynomial, multiply them, and I get what I need. Now, number three, and I want to tell that so far we did not actually use the fact that the, we are looking for um, uh, solutions with non-zero coefficients. You remember this? So far, nothing was uh, dependent upon this. This three is a crucial point where this non-zero coordinates is going to become very important. Okay, nu is shift invariant. Meaning nu of n1 plus vector a n2 and n is nu of n1 and n. So if I simply shift one the, of the polyhedra, I'm not changing anything. And this here, the condition of non-zeroness is going to be important. If I take one of the polyhedra and shift it, this number is not going to change. Again, it is easier. Imagine I started with this system of polynomials, with this system of equations. I can write x to the power alpha here. Will it change the number of solutions with non-zero uh, coordinates? No, the number of solutions is going to be exactly the same. But what will happen to the Newton polynomial of this guy? to the Newton polyhedron of this guy. What happens to it? It shifts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, the most important is 4, which says that nu of n, n, n is n factorial volume n. This will be done in several steps. Because this condition, if this is assumed to be true, plus only 1 and 2 will give me this. Will give me that. So 1, 2, 4 imply that mu of n1 and n is mixed 
volume is some co coefficient k mixed volume of no not the coefficient is very precise n factorial mixed volume of n1 and n only 1 2 and 4 will already imply this why I explained it last time because if you have a symmetric polylinear mapping symmetric polylinear form and you know it on the diagonal this is the diagonal then it extends from this diagonal to the whole space in a unique way thanks to what? to the polarization formula So, since it is obviously symmetric, it is almost obviously polylinear, and if I prove this, then this formula, which is exactly this formula, follows. Simply because a bilinear form in the simplest situation is completely defined by its quadratic part by its uh, uh, by its re restriction to the diagonal so actually what I need to prove is this and to prove this this is going to be important 3 is going to be important for proving 4 3 is going to be important for proving 4 Now, I have this notion of the volume. How can I characterize what volume is? Volume is a rule which takes in any, say, convex compact body and produces a number, correct? There may be a lot of functions which take in a convex body and produce a number. What is it that makes volume special? The volume is a measure. What does it mean? If I take the convex body and say split it by a hyperplane into two parts, then the volume of the whole is the sum of the volumes of the parts. So, volume is a measure. That means it is additive. The volume is a measure, it is additive. So if I split a convex body into two by, say, a hyperplane, uh, then the volume of the whole is the sum of the volumes of the parts. But there are very many measures on the n dimension, on uh, space. On n dimensional space, a lot of measures, different measures. So what is special about the volume? It is shift invariant. It is a hard measure for the, uh, for the, the group structure on RN. The volume is also shift invariant. And then there is a nice hard theorem which says that shift invariant measure is unique up to a coefficient. This is the coefficient. So if I prove that this is uh, this is this is shift invariant, I have already proven this. This is shift invariant. If I prove that it is additive, then I will get that it is some coefficient times the volume. How do I get the coefficient? Consider the situation when all these Newton po uh, when all these polynomials are first degree polynomials, and I have already computed in this case that the coefficient has to be unfactorial. Yes? So coefficient is not a problem, so what is left to, uh, to be worried about? 
and this is the most important part. So, need to prove need to prove that nu of n n n is additive in n. If I prove this, I am done. And this is exactly the point where I'm going to cheat you quite a bit. Because, uh, no, uh, there is a very precise proof, but this proof is pretty... not that bad, but uh, it is very mathematical, I would say. This is mathematically the most uh, difficult part. Did I explain that up to this lemma, the theorem is completely proven. I want to go through it because it's very important to understand the structure of the theorem and why is it true. Actually, it's a very physical theorem. If uh, some, something exists, it must be on the market. So <laughs> if you have a formula, it must have a very natural way of uh, popping up. And this is a natural way of popping up. So I start with this. Okay, I uh, switch to the related new of the polyhedra and I try to establish the property of this function on n polyhedra, on a string of n polyhedra. Symmetricity of this, polylinearity is almost of this. Correct? <coughs> then, if I can prove that this is true, then I have a polylinear symmetric function, and I know it on the diagonal, then I know it everywhere, and by definition of the mixed volume, it is exactly mixed volume. Simply this is Remember, this is the definition of the mixed volume. Yes? Can you say what you mean by additivity? If you I will, uh, okay, if I split n, each n, by the way, into two parts. But that doesn't mean n1 plus n2. No, no, uh, by, uh, uh, n is n prime, n2 prime and the intersection is, say, empty or, say, it so depends. Not addition of no, 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 it is not addition. It is a different thing. Okay? So if I prove this, this, and this, then this follows. But the most important part is proving this. How do I prove this? I need to prove that this now is a function of one convex body, correct? N is one only. And I need to prove that it is volume of N times a coefficient. What is specific about the volume which uh, will allow me to check that this guy is exactly what I want? Volume is additive and volume is shift invariant. And these two conditions define volume up to what? Up to a coefficient. Coefficient is already checked. Which coefficient is this? Shift invariance is checked. So the only thing I have to check is additivity. And this is a difficult part. Again, here you need to use such things as say, uh, implicit uh, mapping theorem, and you need to use some, uh, some ideas from, say, analytic continuation. You can avoid this, but you need to use it. But I will try to explain.
What are you doing when you're splitting end and That's end? exactly what I'm uh, trying to explain right now. I have not uh, yet started. Okay. This is, let me do it in two dimensions, it doesn't matter. This is the Newton, M is a Newton polyhedron. Let me split it into two by a line. So I have this polyhedron and I have this polyhedron. How can I get this polyhedron and this polyhedron as Newton polyhedron? I consider the polynomial which gives me the whole n and I let all coefficients related to these powers to be zero. I will get a polynomial, will I? But it's Newton polyhedron and it's going to be here. Correct? Or I can make the, all coefficients at the powers which are here to be zero and I will get there. So actually what I do, I split my polynomial into the sum of two polynomials usual sum, not product, but, but sum of two polynomials, one with all coefficients here and the, with all powers here, that is all powers here. So I have a polynomial, I split it into two polynomials and Newton of P1 is n prime, Newton of P2 is n two primes. I can do this. Now I'm starting to cheat you. Just bear with me for a moment because I'm cheating you. Take a solution of the equation P1 equals 0. Uh, better to say P1, P, uh, um, that's not good. Just a moment, I need okay I'm computing this I have the same Newton polyhedra but I want to associate different polynomials to this polyhedra because if I associate the same polynomial to each polyhedra polyhedron I will get uh, infinitely many solutions but I'm considering P1 P2, Pn, such that Newton of Pj is the same, but the coefficients are different. Coefficients are, say, generic and different. So actually what I want, I want to take every polynomial, Pj, and split it into two parts. Uh, simply, I want to uh, erase coefficients at the powers on the right and coefficients on the powers on the left. Correct? Okay, and J prime, J two prime, this is true. Now, I want to erase this. and do the following. Consider the polynomial, the equations of this sort, pj prime plus epsilon p j two primes equals zero. j equals one to n. Interesting thing that these polynomials are generic. 
putting epsilon here does not change the generosity of these polynomials. Yes? Now, consider a solution of this system, pj1 equals 0, j equals 1 to non-zero solutions. Consider non-zero solutions of this system. Any non-zero solution of this system. Okay? This is the same system, but with epsilon equals zero. What will happen if zero epsilon is not zero? These solutions will start to evolve as epsilon goes to zero. The here where you need to use the inverse mapping theorem. Not inverse, but implicit mapping theorem. Implicit mapping theorem tells you, with condition of generosity, by the way, tells you that if you have a solution with epsilon equals zero, then this solution is changing, but continuously changing, smoothly changing as epsilon goes to zero. Okay. Mm. I'm afraid I will not be able to finish it today, I, because uh, do you want to know the, what is, uh, do, you know the, do you know the solution of the whole <laughs> mystery, or you are okay with just <laughs> the mystery itself? Um, <laughs> well, we need somebody to talk next week, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is a serious. <laughs> <laughs> the, um, uh, the statement here, what we're looking at is how many solutions are there to generic polynomials in the generic case um, when the polynomials all have the same Newton yes. uh, polyhedron. polyhedron. Now we can take that polyhedron and then we can say add one more point to it, which is to say we're going to allow our polynomials to have one more coefficient. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be saying that uh, we'll then increase, well, we'll be increasing the volume. Yes. And the number of coefficients will increase in, pro the number of solutions will increase in proportion to that volume. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, you all right? I guess uh, you're sort of doing that with this partitioning, mm -hmm. but uh, uh, I guess I'm not, I'm not seeing that in, in any intuitive way. Uh, I will show that there is intuition to that, but uh, you, uh, you see, I s do understand now that maybe I need to explain these ideas around the implicit mapping uh, theorem. Uh, it is, uh, in mathematics, it is a very usual and important way of thinking about these things. And by the way, in physics as well, it is actually the equation of perturbation. Yeah. Yeah. So, the equation of perturbation. So I will, uh, okay, I will, uh, I was very much hoping that I will be through today, but maybe it was a futile <laughs> hope, and uh, I will have to do it on the 8th of August.